Thank you very much. Uh, it's my great pleasure to have the opportunity to share with you some ideas on the topic, challenges and opportunities beyond MOOCs. So I'm T.C. Pong. Um, this is actually the HKUST campus. Uh, it's a beautiful campus, I have to say. If you have not been to our campus, you're all welcome uh, to visit us. We are a very young uh, university. We celebrated our 25th anniversary uh, last year. So we have a lot, lot to learn from the old university like Kyoto as well as Seoul National uh, University. But uh, as far, far as a MOOC is concerned, uh, we started quite early. Actually, we joined uh, Coursera as the first university from Asia to involve in the MOOC uh, movement. Now, for today, at the outline of my talk, I'll first give you an overview on some recent trends and development in education. And then I'll share with you what we have done through the MOOC and blended learning in initiative. Then, then I'll talk about using MOOC for blended as well as experiential learning to address some limitations of the MOOC before I conclude. Now, before I talk about a MOOC, I want first to talk about some recent trends and development by combining pedagogy as well as technological aspects in education. With a better understanding of the learning process, education has gone through a paradigm shift from teacher-centered learning to learner-centric uh, learner -centric learning, uh, and as well as um, in changing the focus on intended learning outcome, as well as the mastery of the subject rather than just the content to be delivered. These changes has led to increasing emphasis on active and collaborative learning. On the technology side, advances in internet and web technologies has allowed learning to be carried out anywhere, anytime using mobile devices. And research in big data and knowledge mining has enabled learning analytics to be carried out to better understand how students learn and how teachers can enhance the teaching and learning. Also, in emerging technology, including AR and VR, has created more stimulating learning environment that would allow active and collaborative, collaborative learning to be carried out. The convergence of the technological as well as pedagogical development has led to the replacement of the traditional lecture style are teaching by the new pedagogies, including blended learning, books, and experiential learning. I'll talk more about these uh, later on. So as you know, lecture style teaching has often been criticized as not very effective. And the criticism can be summarized very well by a code attributed to Mark Chain over 150 years ago, which says, college is a place where professors like to know go straight to the students' national notes without passing through the brains of either. I think this is still true, even nowadays. So how can we make teaching and learning more effective? Perhaps we can go back even further. Over 2,000 years ago, there's a Chinese philosopher uh, called Shenji. He pointed out uh, in his quote that, well, you may not be able to read the Chinese, but even if you do this old style Chinese, you may not be, uh, really understand that. But the English translation is that, tell me and I'll forget. Like what I'm doing here, I'm telling you something. I'm pretty sure that by the end of today, you will have for forget mostly of what I said. And then, show me and I'll remember. That's why I'm using PowerPoint. Hopefully by showing you something, you'll remember better. But most importantly, is involving the learner in the learning process that will make them truly understand. This has been recognized over 2,000 years ago, but we have not really been practicing that. So, and there's been a lot of a study uh, showing that, for example, in this article published in Science, you can show that performance could be improved in different uh, metrics, including attendance, engagement, and most importantly, in the learning outcome. Now, this, is, uh, this study is based on some face-to-face -face instruction. Now, with MOOC, you know what's, what is MOOC, but how can we MOOC make MOOC 
more active. Also make it student, the learner, involved in the, uh, the active learning. So as you know, in MOOCs, students would be watching video. But what I want to emphasize is that MOOC is not just watching video. You know, you watch YouTube. Some of you may have watched uh, tech talk. These are very stimulating talk. But these are passive. It's still one-way delivery. You will forget that very easily, like what I talk about. Tell me, and you'll forget. So in MOOC, in addition to watching just the online video, learners are involved active in the learning process through online quizzes, discussion forum, and other activities. And more importantly, MOOCs can go beyond just offering courses and content. The MOOC platform will be able to collect the learning activities from the learner. Every mouse click you make, every keystroke that you enter will be recorded by the system. So by performing learning analytics, that will allow us to better understand how students learn and how teachers can improve their teaching. So for HKUST, as I mentioned, we joined Coursera in 2012, and then the, we joined Edix in 2013. So far, we have over, um, uh, well, this is not uh, up to date. We now have over 40 books now to over 1 million learners from around the world. And our books are actually uh, quite popular. Uh, for example, last year, in 2016, uh, Ethics ranked the top 10 most popular ethics courses. HKUST's course, uh, Introduction to Java Programming, is one of them. And you can see that there were courses from Berkeley, MIT, and Harvard. This year, uh, we also have a, a course that's on the list. So here you have uh, around 17 courses. And one of these is voted by the staff as the top uh, courses. Uh, again, uh, this is the Java Programming. This is actually a course offered by myself. So I can talk more about that. So this uh, Java programming course, we started to offer that in the summer of 2014. And so far, uh, well, some of the data is interesting. You can see that the students are from uh, over 180 countries, and the demographic, including mostly students from the United States, but there are also a large number of students from India. Actually, this is not quite surprising, because in India, there's a lot of interest in IT. Java programming is, of course, in the IT area. And you can also see that the demographic includes students not only at the college level. There are all, actually around 30% of the students are from secondary school, although it is a course at the university level. We, I have been offering uh, this course for the past three years. So far, we have over uh, 300,000 students uh, registered for this course. I have actually done some computation. I've taught for over 30 years. I'm actually quite old. If I can reach to around 1,000 students every year, in 30 years, the simple, you can do the simple, simple arithmetic. I will get around 30,000 students. In order to get to 300,000 students, I need to teach 100 years. I'm pretty sure that I won't last that long. So you can see this one uh, impact of book. Now, as I mentioned, Doing the learning analytics is very important. So here, we developed a tool called VisBook by Professor Hua Menxi to basically visualize the data we collect from the MOOC. By just giving you the data, it's not meaningful at all. So a, a lot of the instructing, in order to be able to make sense out of the data, somehow you have to do the analytics, you have to be able to visualize the data. So basically, the system will analyze all the activities related to watching a video. Well, when you watch a video, you can pause the video, you can change the speed of the video, you can fast forward, you can rewind. For example, here, these are some of the fast forward activities. Each line will be sent a fast forward. So a lot of students actually go from the beginning to all the way to the end. That means they did not watch the video at all. For whatever reason, they may know the subject already. Here, the blue lines will be sent to rewind. So each line still link go from here to, this uh, is actually synchronized with the video. Here is the timeline of the video. So some students here go from the end all the way to the beginning. They, that means they want to watch the video again. Some would just uh, uh, rewind for a very short uh, duration. Perhaps when the video talked about that particular concept, it was not very clear. 
All right. So by analyzing these kind of activities, uh, we have developed. I'll show you a video on exactly how this uh, system works. Selected from both platforms. Okay, the lecture ahead. video can be selected for carrying out the analysis. You'll so find three are, graphs are under the video. Activities. A graph at the bottom of the window represents the different mouse events, namely play, pause, seek, ray change, stored, and error. This is called a stack graph. One can move the cursor along the graph to find out the frequency of different mouse events entered by the users. Since six can go forward or backward, they are further represented in so two separate graphs. Here, the can, orange strips see. here shows the forward seek event. Each line in the graph represents the starting and ending position of a forward seek. The blue strip below it shows the backward seek events. The backward seek events are of particular interest. Let's switch to another lecture video. This lecture compares the education systems between China and the West. One can easily see that there's an obvious peak here in the stack graph. One can click here to find out the corresponding location in the video. The topic being discussed here is about income distribution of students in the U.S. By selecting demographic information, one can look at the activities of students from different countries. Let's take a look at students from the United States. It's clear that the peak remains because this is probably a topic that's of interest to U.S. students. Let's switch to China. Interestingly, the permanent peak disappeared. Perhaps students in China are not as interested in the topic. Observations like this may impact how the instructor would design the lecture or learning activities on this topic. So you can see that this is the learning pattern for students from China. Well, here you can actually see a peak here for students from China. So you actually go to that particular video location. Well, you have probably guessed it. This is about a topic related to China. And you can see that students from China pay more attention to that. But the instructor probably wants every student to learn about what's happening in the other country, right? So you can see that the intention of the instructor may not always match how the students learn. By analyzing, you can really get some idea. Not only that, you can look at the demographic, you can look, also look at different student groups, different age groups, students from different backgrounds on how they learn. Another important aspect is to look at how the students interact through the discussion forum. All right, so after I post a comment, how the other students react to it. So this is called social network analysis. The feature offered by this analytic tool is for the discussion forum. By clicking on social network and the forum, we can visualize how students interact with each other through their discussion postings. Each student is represented in the network by two attributes. Each the is first student. is his performance in the course, which is color-coded in red if the student performs well or green otherwise. The second is on how active is the student. An active student is represented by a larger circle, while an inactive student by a smaller one. We can look at the interactivities of individual students by moving the mouse around. You For example, this is a very line. active Each student who also performed well, as indicated mouse. by the size of the circle and the red color. You can see that he or she interacted mostly with other high-performing students, as indicated by the red the color. Red Let's look at another student who didn't perform as well, as indicated by the green color. Interestingly, he or she interacted mostly with students who also didn't do too well. Perhaps the instructor could step in to provide some help. So you can see them, some pattern on how students with each other, interact with each other. You can also find out well, how students from different countries interact with students from their own country and so on. All right. So this is on social analytics, but more importantly, it's on how we use this uh, learning analytics. So I'll show you some examples on that. So here is the course that I taught. It's, it's about a concept called abstraction. Well, by abstraction, it means it's abstract. It's something that's difficult to understand. The basic idea of abstraction is to basically separate the what and the how. Right? If I tell you that, would you understand what, what that means? Probably not, right? So if you, for a certain concept, you, you, you want to use example to illustrate, to explain to the students. So here, as you can see, when I talk about abstraction, there's a lot of activities and students rewind, watch the video again. That means I did not explain the concept clearly to the students. And when I look at the video again, this is what I found. This is the example I use. Come up with other daily life examples using abstraction. In driving a car, when we step on the gas pedal, the car is supposed to accelerate. And when we step on the brake, it is supposed to slow down. But we don't really care the mechanics behind how they work. So the word for the brake or the gas pedal, serves certain function. But the implementation is very complicated. Not 
for those uh, non-mechanics, you may not be, 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 be able to understand. And you don't need to understand that in order to drive a car, right? That's to separate the what and the how. Well, students, you can see that they not understand that from the graph. So I use another example uh, here. I could give an example of when you go into an elevator, a lift, you push a certain button for a closed door, you know the what. But this electronics and mechanics, when you go, uh, push a button number five, it's supposed to go to the fifth floor, that's the what. But the how, again, you don't need to understand. I thought these are good examples, but students don't, still don't understand. So I simply asked the students, why don't you give the example yourself? So after that, after I post a, an exercise for the students to post the example by themselves, well, you can see that there are a lot of activities. For example, there are five, five, over 500 postings. And one, one student gave the example, when you do Google search, you know the what. You want to search for something related to the keyword, but the how, the algorithm behind Google search is so complicated that none of us will understand, right? So that's again to separate the what and the how and see what happened. The other students replied by saying, I get it, thanks. Nice explanation, nicely said, very nice example. But well, actually I get a little bit jealous because I seldom get paces like that. But this indicates that, indicate that as a teacher, I use my approach, my example, to try to explain certain complicated concepts. I drive a car almost every day. I go into an elevator in a lift almost every day because in Hong Kong, we have all these tall buildings. But we have forgotten that we have students who are still not even adults. They cannot drive a car. We have students from Africa who have never gone into a tall building. So we use examples that are familiar to us. That's teacher center. Without thinking about how students learn. Now, by involving the students, the students themselves post examples that are more related to the other students. So you can see that by using this kind of approach, you can really improve the teaching. And the example now is the example that I use in class. And the students actually get a better understanding on that. All right. So, now, as, um, I, I want to switch topic now on how we can actually use the MOOC for other purpose. We all talk about flipped classroom. I have done that many times. All right, but what I'm talk, going to talk about is a different kind of flipped classroom. I'm calling it a synchronized flip. The idea of a synchronized flip is that for a normal flipped classroom, you synchronize the video and the in-class activities. Right? Every week, you have the video, you have the activities, video activities, the synchronized. But what we are doing here is asynchronized in the sense that the student will finish all the online activities, just a MOOC, before they come in for the face-to-face -face section. All right? So that's why I'm calling it asynchronized. So here, uh, one pilot that we won uh, last summer is to have students from around the world uh, one third of the students from Hong Kong, around one third from overseas exchange, and one third from mainland China. As I mentioned, they first completed the MOOC, and then they would be doing some assessment because I cannot rely just on the online assessment because you don't even know whether the students did the job by themselves, right? So, and if they pass the assessment, then they come in for a two weeks face-to-face -face summer section. Only two weeks, rather than the entire semester. At the end, they take an examination. If they pass the examination, as well as other requirements, they actually earn credit for the book. But usually, when you take a book, you don't get credits. You get a certificate at the most if you pay some a fee. All right? But here, the students actually get the credits. We issue the, the students the transcript after they actually finish the course. So in a way, for the exchange students, they come in only two weeks, rather than the entire semester. And then, Another aspect of this pilot is that we want to involve professors from not just HKUST. So we actually uh, look at the MOOC, this is my course, and then I found that a Spanish professor also offers Java programming. Uh, Toro probably recognized that uh, this is uh, Carlos. So I, I bought him just for two weeks to teach the course together with me. So here uh, you can see that uh, this is him, this is me. This is the, a flip classroom setting. You can see that the chair and the tables can move, be moved around. And then I also try to introduce activities here. You can see that the students are wearing these red-blue glasses for seeing some uh, virtual uh, 
3D images, right? Again, I want to stimulate the interest of the students. Now, more importantly, I want to use learning analytics in designing the online, the in-class activities. So here, uh, you can see that by analyzing the online activities, there's a lot of activities here. You can see the peak. And this is about a concept called constructor. But you don't need to know what exactly is constructor, but because of that, I try to design some activities. Is to go through the code as a group. So it's a so basically identify debugging all the bugs. exercise. And then try to fix that. So this is uh, what happened in, in the classroom setting. The student work on the problem. We have the TA going around. So at the end, you can see that I'm throwing some candy. Just to motivate the students. You know, here, the students try to answer my question. What's the problem there? So this is about constructor. So the activity is designed based on the learning analytics. Have no time. All right. So okay, do you work on that yourself or as a group? As a group. Okay. All right, so you and you can see that the students are actually very enthusiastic trying to answer the next question. All right. So this kind of activity is important in designing flipped classroom teaching. Another activity that we introduce is by the Spanish professor. I have never heard of Kahu uh, before last summer. And this has, is what has been using. Kahu is basically a polling system, like a clicker. But then we have some game element in it. All right, so the students will try to answer the question as fast as possible. At the end, there will be a winner. All right, so now, uh, these are the uh, uh, activities that they design. Again, I, the value of I is zero at the beginning, but we the value of here. So this is the interface. The students try to look at the question and then look at the code and find out the bug. All right, so in fact, it's a trick. So he's saying that. There's a trick. He's telling the student there's a trick, and the students now realize that they're being tricked. So see, see all the laughing. Okay. <laughs> so see, this is the correct answer. This is the So this is the this is the correct answer, but only eight out of thirty some get the correct answer. Now he's trying to explain that there's a uh, a, a bug here. That's the error. Now, I, I'm trying not I trying to uh, teach you computer nine, programming, seven. but what I want to point out is that if I simply tell the students that this is a bug, again, at the end of the class, most of the students will forget about that. By involving them in activities like this, and most of them make mistakes, most of them now will remember this is not the right way to do programming. All right? So, this again, this uh, learning analytics, by using learning analytics, we also find that it's a problem. So, and then at the end, as you can see, there's a uh, letter board. All right, students are really uh, more enthusiastic in participating in these kind of activities. Now, uh, I want to move, okay, so we also done some survey to ask the student, do you like Kahoo? Well, actually only two thirds of the students like it. And was it fun? Again, two thirds. Well, this is understandable because for the student who get the wrong answer, they wouldn't like it, right? But what is interesting is that when they ask, did, did you learn? A lot more students think that you are, they are learning. And would you like to have more? Even if, though if they don't like it, they don't find it that fun, but many more like it, like to have more. And then we also done some um, survey on the feedback uh, questionnaire. Uh, from a score of 0 to 100 on the average, most of the students like the experience. For example, here, the online content and activ activities prepare me well for the face-to-face -face section, which is important to link the online and face-to-face. -face. And here, uh, there have been a lot of opportunity for me to interact with the instructor, TA, and student, which has de uh, deepened my uh, learning. Again, the students like that. So we look at the feedback from the students uh, very seriously. As I mentioned, this could be used for, uh, as a model for expanding the student exchange as well as faculty exchange. I want now to talk about another project, which is for our first year engineering students. All right, well, we want to basically to expose our first year students to knowledge and skills from different engineering disciplines. Because for the high school students, when they come into the engineering school, many of them don't know much about what is engineering. All right, and then at HQUST, 
the students come into the School of Engineering without a major. We want to give them a more informed decision. So we want to give them introduction to different dis uh, engineering discipline. Now, the problem is that for the first year engineering students, they have very different background. If we just offer a course, it's difficult to decide what to offer or what to not to offer. So we put the basic knowledge online so that the students can learn at their own pace. All right? And then at, after that, they will be engaged in team projects to connect what they learn in the experiential learning uh, mode to do some hands-on uh, uh, projects and so on. And so this, we call that a blended experience, so learning experience using MOOC. So this is the um, uh, online part. We are doing it on using the HK MOOC, a MOOC based on open ethics developed for the uh, Hong Kong tertiary education sector. And here we have three components, mechanics, electronics, and uh, computer science to develop uh, Android app. Again, these, some of them may uh, be uh, something that they know already, but some don't. So they learn at their own pace. After that, uh, also, when they learn at their own pace, we need to let them know how well they are progressing. Otherwise, they would wait till the last minute. So every week, we send them the progress. For example, here, uh, uh, this basically gives you the top range and the lower range of the activities. And this is where the students stand. So for example, these students have done very well. They are all at the top ring except for the last one, right? And then this one here, you can see that uh, he or she has done quite well in the first four weeks, but not for the last two. So we let them know how they are progressing relative to the rest of the class. This is very helpful. And then the, this is the face-to-face -face section. We, after they finish the online, we bring them in uh, in the classroom setting. And oh, well, this is um, something we have the problem here, but so I flip it. So the flip classroom. So here you can see that it's a drone. Okay. So and it's actually the latest drone. It has the ability to follow the gesture, right? So you can see that when the drone here. So it's basically follow that. Well, the reason why we want to do this is that well. Strong is very fascinating, but when I ask how many students have actually flew a drone before, before in, in the beginning of class, guess how many among 60 students? Zero. They heard about drone, but they have never tried it because in Hong Kong, it's difficult to find a place that you can legally fly a drone. But then on campus, after that class, every student, 100% of the student had the opportunity. Now, what is even more important is that after that, we took apart the drone, explained to them the technology behind it. There's a GPS, there's a gyroscope to keep the uh, balancing of the, the machine, and so on. The students are really very attentive and have a lot more questions. Right? Again, if you simply explain to them the technology without actually having them flying a drone, they would not be interested. So we really want to expose the students to the new technology, to the emerging technology in, in, uh, like the drone, and also, uh, here, we want every student to have the opportunity to play with some power tool. Engineers, they really want it to work. So they're drilling, they're using the saw. And uh, here, the, this is the 3D printer. After the, uh, the course, every student would have the experience uh, p using 3D printing. Because one of the components of the drone that they build has to have a 3D printer component. And then they are uh, doing the electronics, all right? And we also uh, introduced the, to the students uh, the idea of design thinking. Design is essential in engineering. And in design thinking, building prototype is also important. So here is okay, an example uh, showing that before they build the airship, so they are using just um, uh, the, a fan in blowing the balloon to learn the concept about uh, the, the balancing of the machine and so on. So after that, they will actually uh, build the machine okay, with a, a larger balloon. And then the, here, you have the propeller being controlled by a journal and so on. So in the first year, we want to introduce to them that kind of concepts. And then here, 
Uh, after that, they actually uh, participate in a competition. Uh, so this, in this competition, basically they want to find the drone to pick up the, uh, the objects here. This is actually uh, the, the bonus. If they uh, pick up this object, they'll probably be the winner. So here is a video showing. So you can see that, uh, oh, sorry, that they have uh, very different kind of machines. Okay, so uh, basically, I, I think it's a video showing how uh, the, the, uh, the airship that they build uh, work in the competition. Now, before I end, I want also to introduce to you something that uh, we participated uh, called the uh, Global Virtual Exchange. Well, you know what is a uh, exchange program. Students go to a, a foreign country physically for one semester usually. But now, there are limitations. For example, you have to usually spend one semester. This could be very expensive. And also for certain students, if they cannot get the credit transfer back, they, they may be delayed in the graduation. So here, a, another limitation for HKUST is the housing. Right? You know in Hong Kong, housing is very expensive. During the regular semester, it's difficult to find place for all the students. But in the summer, it's very different. Okay? So here, uh, for the virtual exchange, uh, in order for that to work, we actually brought in our partners. There are eight other partners in addition to HKUST including in uh, Europe, in Australia, and uh, in the US. So after this meeting, uh, we actually signed the agreement to set up this uh, Global Virtual Exchange Alliance with these universities. What is the uh, difference between just a MOOC and this is that these are credit-bearing online courses. These are fully online courses, but together with a proctored examination. So uh, we'll be sending the examination to the location of the partner institution, the student would take the exam in the classroom setting with an invigilator. So that would be monitored rather than just doing everything online. But the learning part is online. And then at the end, the students get credits from the host institution. We issue them the transcript and credits. So this also provides them with the, uh, a culturally diverse online learning experience. But not physically, but you know nowadays the students really spend a lot of time online, right? Like the Facebook and the WhatsApp, uh, other social media, right? This would give them an opportunity to learn something useful online. And you can see that uh, this is the web page uh, that we set up for our students to register for the courses. And it's actually a very rich of collection of courses already. This is the first year of op operation. Uh, you can see some uh, engineering courses, uh, also uh, some um, health and medicine courses, uh, public administration, and uh, we have some uh, language courses, science courses, basic science, and then the even anthropology. So these are courses offered by uh, different universities. And as a science and technology university, this is very good because we cannot offer as much uh, this rich collection of courses because of the faculty that we have, mostly related to science and technology. But now they have uh, the opportunity to take courses from our partners without leaving Hong Kong. So just to summarize, uh, we use MOOC as a catalyst for improving teaching and learning on campus by offering branded, free and experiential learning courses. And as I mentioned, it's important to use the learning anal analytics in order to really be able to use the MOOC effectively. And also, to we use MOOC to outreach to uh, prospective undergraduate, even postgraduate students. As I mentioned, there are high school students taking the course. In fact, we now get a lot of applicants who have taken our MOOC and now trying to apply to HKUST for admission. And we also try to package our MOOC into uh, massive open online uh, programs and degrees, uh, like we talked about before, there are uh, degrees like in Arizona, uh, 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 talked about by Toro, that uh, the, the entire freshman year is online. So these are, I'm calling these uh, massive open online programs. And Georgia Tech and some Michael Master, these are degrees. And then uh, use book as a platform for inter-institutional collaboration. This is a very important uh, strategy by HKUST. In fact, we are now working with some Asia University to set up a virtual 
exchange program just for Asia. Well, for the global virtual exchange, it's a good idea, but one problem is that since it's covering 24 hours of time zone, it's impossible to find an, an exam time that would fit all the students during the daytime. But within Asia, it's easily doable because the time zone is just within two or three hours. All right, so uh, I hope that uh, we can all work together to make more meaningful, uh, useful uh, application of MOOCs. Yeah, thank you very much.